day and welcome to this edition of Sala Says. Today we're joined by Jonathan Shabowski, who's a senior architect with the Office of the CTO here at Solace. Jonathan, recently you wrote a blog on microservices that has been um, receiving rave reviews by our audience and by our readers. Let's start off with the basics. What's a microservice and why are they so popular today? Yeah, so it's actually kind of interesting. Microservices, um, uh, in of itself, it, it doesn't really have an industry accepted definition. So. Um, in my opinion, and sort of uh, doing a lot of research in my own experience, uh, there's four sort of key central tenets to what an actual microservice is. Uh, first of all, they uh, they're generally need to be small in size and specifically single in purpose. They need to communicate using uh, technology agnostic protocols. Thirdly, uh, be independently deployable and sort of tied into that uh, release via automated processes. Obviously, in, in to your second point, um, these microservices all need to, to communicate together. Um, in the blog, you mention um, a quote from Martin Fowler about uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Could you expand a little bit on what that actually means? Yeah, so it's really a central tenet of microservices that um, you shouldn't have unneeded logic that's actually occurring in the communications tier of your applications. So what, that, what we're really specifically talking about there is that uh, traditionally in, in SOA systems, enterprise service buses really kind of ruled the day. And um, a lot of logic kind of went into those enterprise service buses as it relates to um, protocol transformation, dealing with uh, message transformation. And really, it was really hard to troubleshoot those kind of environments when things went wrong. By, so by having more, um, a more simple communication methodology, it really allows these systems to not only still communicate effectively, but be much more simple and much more robust because of it. Another point that you brought up in your first section was around um, agnostic messaging and, and transfer protocols. Uh, and you spent a lot of time talking about REST. Um, can you delve a little bit into you know, where REST fits best into this world of microservices? So yeah, absolutely. So obviously REST is becoming cr incredibly popular and, and really for good reason. Um, it's a very natural way to think. It utilizes the best of, um, of what HTTP does well. And, um, and because of that, a lot of people have really flocked to using REST as that technology agnostic protocol. Um, but one of, you know, one of the big purposes that, uh, that that blog was trying to cover is, while REST is a really great capability, um, there are other tools in the toolbox that you can use in order to build um, the best microservices architecture possible. That sort of leads to uh, sort of the, the next step that I read when I was reading this blog about this um, event-driven microservices. I've also seen it called event-oriented microservices. And that seems to be very different in nature and have its own subcategory. Can you explain a little bit about what this event-driven microservices is really about? Yeah, sure. So event-driven microservices is really, you know, it's leveraging the concepts of microservices, again, having a small independent um, units of code that are deployed, but that ultimately communicate in an event-driven way. So instead of having everything sort of be request reply and, you know, if you have a service that needs to call another service, um, you end up with sort of a, a cascading um, invocation list that's all sort of blocking. It allows for applications to really just communicate asynchronously as events come in and allows the uh, ultimately the end user experience, which is what's, what's critical in a lot of applications, to be as uh, responsive and as performance as possible. So event-driven microservices are, are definitely a different category, but do they have different requirements for the way they message? In the best case scenario, what, what you really want your microservices to do is um, be very loosely coupled, um, be non-blocking for performance reasons, and again, be sort of single purpose so that you know, you're not adding a whole bunch of complex failure scenario handling into your code. They should really just do the job that they're supposed to do and ultimately hand off to another service if, if necessary to perform additional functionality. And ultimately, you know, one of the challenges really becomes that, you know, when you're when your different teams are sort of um, subcomposed and one team's writing one microservice and another team's writing another, um, that's really a, an effective way to uh, distribute the work and get work done. But where the challenge becomes is if it's rest in between, 
um, the, the, the group that's ultimately calling that other service, they have to know a lot about how that service is going to um, handle different scenarios. How long should I wait for a response to come back? Um, what should I do when an error occurs? Should I just reinvoke it? How long should I wait before I reinvoke it? There's there's a lot of things that you have to really consider in order to ensure that uh, that you building a robust architecture. This feels like it really fits into to a, a category near to Solus. How would things like a message bus, message router environment aid microservices? Yeah, absolutely. So. Certainly, certainly. Again, you know, we're not here to um, to bash on REST. REST has its place, certainly with synchronous interactions, um, absolutely on externally facing APIs. But when it comes down into where you're trying to link up your different microservices within your architecture, um, sort of changing the pattern that you're thinking in and thinking more about asynchronous and thinking about how you can make um, use of events is really what's key. And obviously. Um, by using messaging, messaging really empowers those asynchronous uh, interactions and it's just really a perfect setup for writing um, really robust microservices. You know, and sort of crossing the streams a little bit here, you know, the microservices have also come up with the rise of cloud. Um, how do we see cloud and microservices working together? Yeah, absolutely. So microservices, because they're independently deployable and they're small, um, the cloud is really a is really a good neighbor, if you will, to using microservices because you can scale up and down your microservices, um, just like you can scale up and down your cloud usage dynamically, and and that's really a good key for microservices. Um, but the key is that if you um, if you improperly architected your microservices tier where you are making use of a lot of REST internally and you've got a lot of different blocking, you sort of have to scale all of your microservices up at the same time in order to compensate for one slow microservice. By using, again, more event-driven architecture, um, you can actually just scale up the single microservice that's taking more time in order to provide you know, more memory, more CPU, what have you, more resources um, at the cloud level get that workload done, survive whatever that event is, you know, maybe it's a new product offering on your website, whatever that event is, get through that and then scale down in order to save um, on your total cost of ownership for your system. So Jonathan, thanks for your time today. This has actually been really fascinating. Um, microservices are clearly a way that, that the, the future is going um, and we hope that our audience and readers both take a chance to learn more about microservices. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time there in New York. We appreciate you being with us today. For those who are watching us, we're looking forward to seeing you on the next Solace Says. Remember, you can always find Jonathan's blog on solace.com blog. And our technology is always available on the laboratories at dev.solace.com. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Solace Says.